Our second one is King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven, living in me. final one tonight, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song.
after the introduction, let's all stand and sing probably one of the most familiar hymns you'll ever sing. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Let's stand after the introduction, all of us, and let's sing to God's praise. <laughs>
thanks to the praise group for helping us tonight. Thank you for singing out so well. And what a great, great hymn that is. Let's just for a moment or two bow quietly. Let's pray for God's blessing upon our meeting again tonight. Let's pray for God's help and for his blessing. Our God and our Father, once again, we come quietly into your holy presence and we bow as always in the Savior's name. We thank you so much, our Father, for the opportunity to be met together on this new Lord's Day evening. We thank you so much for the opportunity to sing these great hymns and choruses and to remind ourselves of the love of God for a world of sinners lost. And to thank you for that old rugged cross where the Lord Jesus Christ came to lay down his life and to die for the sin of this old world. Father, what a story we have to proclaim tonight. For Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And our Father, since your word tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then we know tonight that the gospel is a message of good news for every single one of us gathered in this building and for those who will join us tonight on Facebook Live. We thank you, Father, that we're here to sing your praise, but we thank you that we're also here to listen to your word. We pray for Pastor Hoey as he comes again tonight to open up the word of God to us that you will grant him your help and your blessing. We pray, our Father, that each one of us under the sound of his voice will be attentive to what it is that God the Lord would say to each one of us tonight. We thank you, Father, for revelation who have come to minister in song, and we thank you so much for their ministry in past days, and we simply pray that they too might know the leading of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God upon their ministry tonight. Thank you for every head bowed before you just now. Thank you for those joining us on Facebook. Father, we just ask that each one of us will know that it has been good for us to be here. For here, we've heard the voice of God. Maybe even tonight, some who hear the voice of God, perhaps for the first time, would come to know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on that cross for their sins. So we commend everything to you and pray for your blessing upon us tonight, and we ask it all in the sea of your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, lovely tonight to have Revelation with us, and you're very, very welcome. We're going to wait, please, while you bring your first two pieces. Thank you.
While walking down the dead end road, no one still could see. I was ruined by a life of sin, chasing feathers, binding me.
Thanks to Revelation tonight for coming to sing. The worst thing in the world that your soul would be lost. That's why tonight we've been singing about the cross and about the one who took our place and died our death so that our soul might be saved. I want to welcome all of you as you joined with us tonight, both in the building and those on Facebook Live. And if you're visiting here for the very first time, well, I want to say to you, you're very, very welcome, and I hope you'll come back and you'll join with us on another occasion. Thanks to Pastor Alan Hoey, who has been our speaker this morning, and again, he will preach tonight, and his wife Heather, who's with us. We welcome them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And again, thanks to Revelation for coming and sharing in our harvest services. Now, there will be supper tonight for everybody after the service here. Uh, it'll be over in the church hall. That's just across the way from where we are just now. And you'll be made most welcome. If you want to come, join with us, and we'll have an opportunity just to have a cup of tea, a bit of fellowship. And please, if you can stay, we hope that you will. No youth fellowship tonight, no praise group practice the offering for our harvest services will be divided between the Storos Foundation and Good News for Everyone, or the Gideons, as it's better known, perhaps, from the past. Can I just say a big thank you to all the ladies who spent time on Friday and perhaps since that getting the building all prepared for our harvest services. We don't take that for granted. So thank you very much for making the effort and for all that you've done. It looks lovely. And we really do appreciate that very much. Tuesday night and Tuesday morning, first of all, no parents and toddlers. Tuesday night, no good news club. Wednesday, Bible study and prayer meeting at 8, exploring Ephesians. Friday, 12.15, Friday, Bible study. And 7.30 to 9.30, Friday night, will be youth club. Then Saturday, 2.30, Torch Fellowship. The speaker is Pastor David Patterson. The singer is Margretta Patterson. And all are welcome to that meeting. 7.30, the CEF Mourn area are holding their autumn missionary evening in our church hall. Reports from Stephen Hamilton, who works in Dublin. Our own Letitia MacDonald will give a report on Youth Challenge. I'll be the closing speaker. The praise will be led by the Senior Youth Challenge Choir, and supper will be provided. There will also be a children's program for primary school age. So if you're doing nothing on Saturday night, why not come back again, join us? That will be a good evening together. Next Lord's Day, we meet at 10 o'clock in the morning for Sunday school and Bible class. 11.30 is our morning service and breaking of bread. Adam McDonald will be speaking to the boys and girls. Ali and Lindsay Farrell will be in Children's Church. And Diane Maidley, Yvonne McCrum, Kristen Guinness, and Aaron Bell will be on Christ's duty. 5.45, the prayer meeting, half past six, the gospel meeting, and God willing, I'll be preaching at both those services. Youth Fellowship will be back on at eight o'clock, and there will be a praise group practice after church. The CEF have launched recently their new journal aimed at children aged seven to 14 to help them understand and also to articulate uh, the gospel more Confidently, the aim of this journal, Go and Tell, is to guide and equip Christian children to witness and to share their faith in a natural way with their friends. So a night has been arranged in the church hall with David Crutchley, Monday the 6th of November at 7.30, to explain about the book, how to use it. We're inviting parents, children, youth workers, or anyone that's interested to come and to hear about this exciting new resource. David will also be back on Monday the 20th of November. He's holding a training session for all children's workers, workers in Sunday school, workers in the Bible class, those who do children's talks on a Sunday morning, and for those who would like to have their name added to the rota. Also includes Good News Club, any aspect of the work amongst children or young people here in the church. If we're going to teach them, we want to do it in the best way possible, and we hope this will be an evening well spent with David, who, of course, is the area worker for Mourn with CEF. Anyone who holds a CEF mission area, uh, Mourn area mission box, anyone who gives a donation in lieu of a collection box, please bring in their box or donation to Lindsay Forrell before Sunday the 12th of November. That's all the announcements made subject, of course, to the Lord's will.
Revelation, thank you for coming tonight. We're going to wait while you sing again for us. Thank you. Pastor, for the invitation to be down here once again in the Harvard <coughs> service. And can I apologize for uh, Paul Irwin, the, the third member of the group. His aunt passed away and Friday passed, and the funeral was this afternoon. So uh, our thoughts and prayers are with him, but he was unable to be here, and he does send his apologies. <coughs> but it is good to be here in the house of the Lord tonight. And uh, we're maybe struggling a wee bit by the number, singing songs that we don't normally sing as a group, but we know that the Lord is in it and the Lord has his hand in everything. He has a plan and a purpose for everything. I want you to listen as Peter uh, sings this song. It's just simply entitled, Consider the Lilies. You know, we look around us and everything seems to be out of control, but it's not. God is still in control, and he's in control of your life today. <laughs>
On this harvest celebration, we have accepted Christ as your Savior. Thanks again to Revelation. It's been our privilege today to have as our speaker, Pastor Alan Hoy, and he's going to come just now and read the scriptures and bring us the Lord's message. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, folks. Good evening. I can do better than that now. There's enough of you here to do better than that. Good evening, folks. That's better. Lovely to see you tonight. Joy to be with you today. Thank you so much again for the invitation to be here on your Harvest Sunday. Thanks to John and Christine for their hospitality and well-fed and watered. And Heather and me enjoyed fellowship uh, with the folks today. So thank you so much for inviting us along. If I were to ask you this evening, 
what's your favorite harvest portion of Scripture? Out of all the portions that you have heard over all the years, I wonder what your favorite one is. I can hear the, whir the wheels whirling in your head already, trying to figure out what it may be. Well, do you know what mine is? And I would, I would hazard a guess. This is a big statement now. I would hazard a guess. I don't think anybody in this gathering tonight will think about this portion of Scripture as being a harvest portion of Scripture. I would go as far as saying in all of the Bible, this is the best harvest portion of Scripture you could ever find. Let me read it to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isn't that glorious? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's that portion of Scripture? 23rd Psalm. Aye, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. If you just think about it, it's the most glorious portion of Scripture to read in a Harvest Sunday because we sung this morning, Great is thy faithfulness, didn't we? Here we have it in the Psalm. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's the only one who can lead beside the green pastures and the still waters. He is the only companion through all of life. He's the only one who can feed your soul in what it really desires. He's the only one who offers a home, a home for eternity. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, of all the portions of Scripture in the Bible, I have to tell you, Psalm 23 is my favorite portion in all the Bible. I could spend the rest of my ministry just studying Psalm 23 and preaching it every week. I just love Psalm 23. Someone has said that Psalm 23 charms more griefs and rests, uh, uh, sorry, charms more griefs to rest than all the philosophy of the world. It's a wonderful, wonderful psalm. I want to think about it this evening because we want to look at our Harvest Sunday. And this is a psalm of spiritual fruitfulness. This is a psalm of spiritual harvest. You see, it's a psalm that so often, when we think of the 23rd Psalm, we, we think of solemn occasions. We think of funerals. We think of heartaches and sorrows. We think of tears and cries and pain. We associate that with Psalm 23, and Psalm 23 so often read in the midst of all those crises of life. But we have to remember, and we can't forget, that Psalm 23 is a psalm of David. It's actually his testimony psalm. It's a psalm of life. It's a psalm of joy. It's a psalm of living. It's a psalm of purpose. It's a psalm of assurance. It's a psalm of blessed assurance for eternity. It's a most glorious, glorious psalm. And I want to look <coughs> at this psalm this evening. And I want to bring before you very quickly a th the threefold secret for living. A threefold secret for living. When I look at the world today and I listen to the voices of men and women, it seems to me that everybody wants life. We want real life. We want freedom. We want lasting joy. We want peace. We want to live our own life. We want to do our own thing. And everybody's looking for that elusive ingredient that we call peace. The sad situation is that the vast majority 
of men and women have turned away <coughs> from the only one who can deliver them from the maze of sin that they're in and bring to their hungry soul that satisfaction. He's the only one <coughs> that can bring a spiritual harvest to the barn souls of men and women. <coughs> My unsafe friend in this meeting tonight, in this wee psalm of only six verses, there's a secret for living. If you want to know what the secret is for living, it's found in these six verses. <coughs> My question to you would be this. Do you want it? Do you want this secret for living? Well, you say to me, well, pastor, what do you mean? What are you getting at? <clears throat> well, let me try and explain to you what I mean this evening. You see, when I look at Psalm 23, I discover in this psalm that it unlocks the secret of a peaceful life. It unlocks the secret of a peaceful life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If you were to read Psalm 22, you would find that it represents the Lord Jesus Christ dying to save you and me. In verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But we have in Psalm 23, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is living to take care of me. He is living to provide for me. He is living to lead me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If you go to the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, we find these two Psalms joined together just in one verse. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's Psalm 22. Then it says, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's Psalm 23. Isn't it wonderful? Are you looking for something tonight that really will grip your heart and grip your soul and grip your life? Are you looking for something tonight that will bring meaning into this dissatisfied world that you live in? Are you wanting, for, wanting something tonight that will answer the emotional problems that you are dealing with, the spiritual hunger that you see around you and indeed is in your soul tonight? Well, I want to tell you, you'll find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world today, as Paul said to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 4, that men and women are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Maybe that's you this evening. You're more a lover of sin than you are of God because you're not saved. But I want to tell you, the Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death, the harvest to the man or the woman who is without the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal separation from God in hell and in the lake of fire. You see, you and I, because of our sin, we have forgotten the precious promise of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I want to tell you the most important thing in your life tonight if you're not saved, the most important thing is not getting more money. It's not getting a bigger house. It's not getting a flashier car. It's not getting better suits. It's not getting better dress. It's not going on bigger holidays. The most important need of your heart and your soul tonight is Jesus Christ. You need to be saved. That's what you need to seek first for. He is the one that should be at the very forefront of your mind this evening. My sinner friend, men and women today have done from the Garden of Eden. They have tried to, to meet the need of their soul through the resources of the world, through the resources of sin. But the great need of your soul cannot be satisfied by pounds. It cannot be satisfied by prancing around the dance floor. It cannot be satisfied by the perversions of the flesh. It cannot be satisfied by position or prestige. Dear friends, there is a need in the heart of the soul and the mind of every man and every woman that only Christ can meet. Only Christ. And I tell you, it's wonderful. Oh, but you say, I remember, <clears throat> I remember, a man came to my door one night when, I was, when we were in Monkstown. Terrible wet night. And he came to the door and he knocked the door. And I went to the door and opened it. <clears throat> and here was this man that he was the worst for drink. He had a lot of drink in him. 
And I don't know why he came to my door, but he came to my door, I didn't know. And he says, you couldn't give me a lift home. And I says, certainly I'll give you a lift home. How long do I get my shoes on? And I got the shoes on and got them sort of pulled into the car as best I can and took them up home and left them to his doorstep. And he says, how much do I owe you? I says, you owe me nothing. I says, I'm only too glad to do it. But I says, I'll take a, I'll take a promise from you. He says, what's that? I says, I want you to promise to come to church for I'm the Baptist pastor. And I, I says, I says I, I want, I'll take a promise from you. I want you to come to church. Oh, you know what he said to me? It's never left me. He says, you wouldn't want somebody like me in your church. He says, you wouldn't want me in your church. I says, friend, you're the very boy I'm looking for every day. <laughs> You're the very boy I'm looking for. And maybe you're sitting here this evening and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know that gospel message, it's all right for those folk that are brave and clean and tidy and decent, but God would never want me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm not able enough. I'm not the type of person God would want. You know the wonderful thing about God's salvation? God's salvation will adapt to your need. It will. God, when I get saved... When I get saved, the Lord... Now, I was only 14. And I didn't know anything about the Bible or anything like that there. I didn't go to gospel meetings or anything. I praise the Lord for the youngsters that are here this evening. But when I get saved, two nights, three nights before I get saved, I had, I had two dreams. And the Lord spoke to me. I'm not Daniel or anything like that there. But the Lord spoke to me through two dreams. And that's how the Lord spoke to me. He spoke to me about a dream about standing before God on Judgment Day, and the books would be open. And all I could hear was, hoy, hoy, hoy. Oh, yes, Alan, hoy. And I woke up. And it was as if God hadn't fell down heaven or hell, lost or saved. I didn't know. But I want to tell you, I woke up, I was shivering. Shivering. And the Lord spoke to me again through another dream. And that's how the Lord spoke to me, because I was only a wee boy of 14. I couldn't understand theology. Nobody could sit down and bring theology. I wouldn't have understood it. Nobody could tell me, Alan, you need to read the Bible, because I couldn't read. I couldn't read. But you see, God is so wonderful, and the gospel is so adaptable. That where you are tonight, whatever your need is, whatever the mess of your life, whatever you're dealing with, whatever's binding your soul, whatever's ruining your life, whatever, whatever's tying you up tonight, the gospel's the answer. Jesus is the answer to my every need. So don't you sit here tonight and think you're out of reach of the gospel. Because the gospel can reach my, it, it can reach the, the university lecture. And it can reach the savage in the jungle. It can reach the young and the old. It can reach the rich and the poor. Wherever you are. It can reach the ones on the clean side of the broad road as well as the ones on the dirty side of the broad road. Wherever you are tonight, my dear friends, whatever you're suffering, whatever you're going through, Jesus is the answer. Maybe you're here tonight. And you're fed up with life. And you've been trying to find peace. And you've been trying to find that answer. And you've tried everything. You've tried relationships. They've just broke your heart. You've tried drink and other things. And it's just broke your body. You tried other things that just broke your hope. And maybe you're here this evening and you think to yourself, life's not worth living anymore. And maybe, maybe you're here and this you're saying, this is my last meeting. After this meeting's over, I'm going to finish my life. Maybe you're watching in this evening. You're not in the building, but you're at home. And life has broken you. Life has ruined you. Sin has crippled you. And you can't find a way out. And you can't find the peace. And you can't find the meaning. And you can't find the hope. And you're thinking, I'm done. I'm done. I'm listening to this last gospel message and I'm done. And I'm going to have done with life tonight. Can I say to you this evening, the Lord Jesus Christ says this to you this evening, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. Do you see the mess you're in tonight? The Lord Jesus Christ is the way out of it. Do you get that? All the lies that you have been living, the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And all the deadness is in your heart and in your soul tonight. Jesus is the life. Isn't that not wonderful? You see, that's what I have. As a Christian, I don't know if there is these folk. I look at that and I'm not entirely sure. But that's what I have. That's what I have. That's what Jesus has given to me. Friends, I want to tell you, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, He unlocks the secret of a peaceful life. He says, my peace. Isn't it wonderful when the Lord said to his disciples, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto thee, then let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isn't it amazing when he said that? It was on the eve of Calvary. It wasn't when he was going on holiday. It wasn't when things were going easy. It wasn't when they were healing him as the, as the Messiah and waving the palm trees, the palm leaves, and all the rest of it. No, when he was facing Calvary, the greatest struggle of his soul, the greatest agony he would ever face, when he would take the sin of the world in his body on the tree, he says to his disciples, My peace I give unto you. Oh, I tell you, dear friends, if the Lord Jesus Christ facing Calvary's cross and all that it meant, and you and I could never fathom it, could have peace. And peace enough to give to you and to give to me. I want to tell you, he'll meet you at the point of your need this evening. And he'll give you the peace that your soul needs. Oh, he will. He unlocks the secret to a peaceful life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want to tell you today, Jesus is enough. Jesus. Oh, says you pastors. See, you Christians. You, you, you use Christianity like a crutch. Christianity is just a crutch for you. If you read your Bible, anybody had ever met the Lord with a crutch threw it away because Jesus was the cure. He's not the crutch. He's the cure. And he's the cure for your soul this evening. He unlocks the secret of a peaceful life. But I want to tell you something else. When you read this psalm, you discover that the Lord Jesus Christ reveals the secret of a triumphant death. He reveals the secret of a triumphant death. Verse 4 says, Yea, lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. I remember we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. He is the Lord, my shepherd. So, so let's hear what he says to those that trust in him. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, these are his final words to the disciples. And he says this to them. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Friends, this tells me that no matter the circumstances of my life, I'll never be alone. No matter where I am in life, I'll never be abandoned. You see, I have a Savior who has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Do you know what that means in the Greek? When the Lord says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee. I will never send thee back. That's what it means. I'll never send you back. When the Lord saved me, he didn't ask for a receipt. There's no going back. He says, I'll never send you back. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Do you know what that means? In the Greek, it means I'll never leave you behind. I'll never send you back, and I'll never leave you behind. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, with me every step of the way. My Savior is not far removed from me. He is not uninvolved in my life. He's not disinterested in my distresses. He's not inconvenienced by my needs. He is the one who will for all eternity uphold me. The one who holds the universe. The one who sustains it by the power of his word is the one who holds me in the palm of his hand. What a Savior. What a Savior. 
Oh, can you see, dear friends, that there is, there is a great, great devoted love that just drips from these words. My, they're like honey from the honeycomb. Yea, lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Life can be a lonely existence. For sin has broken the fellowship and communion that we were created to enjoy. You know what you and I were created for? You and I were created for fellowship with God. That's what we were created for. To enjoy God. To have fellowship with God. To commune with God. To understand God and to know God. In a real and vital and living way. That's what we were created for. We were created to walk with God. And to talk with God. And to enjoy Him forever. That is why loneliness is such a great curse in our society today. Loneliness is not always uh, being devoid of people around about you. There are many times you could be in a room with hundreds of people and be lonely. You can be in a room with many people that you even would call your friends and still be lonely. It's got nothing to do with how many friends you have. It's got nothing to do with how many people are around about you. Loneliness is the absence of God in your life. Loneliness is not having the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Loneliness is missing out on the greatest experience that your soul can ever know, knowing God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why loneliness is such a problem today. It takes our young people to places that they shouldn't be going to do things that they really shouldn't be doing, to hang out with people they really shouldn't be hanging out with. And, and if you ask them, why, why are you doing these things? Well, they'll tell you, first of all, I've nowhere else to go. And I want to feel that I belong. I want to have company, that I belong to something. The Lord says in John 14, verses 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> is not just a friend for life. He's the friend in death, and he's the friend in eternity. You see, you can be surrounded with people all your life. <clears throat> you can belong to the biggest of families. But there's a day, and we have all experienced it, where we have sat beside the bedside of a loved one. And we have held their hand as, as if we were trying to keep them here with us. And we held their hand so tightly, and we gripped so hard, and, and we longed that we could just hold them. Hold them back from eternity. Hold them in this world just a wee while longer. But you see, the Scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die. And when death came, and the heart for the last time gave a beat. And then it stopped. And that loved one, we watched them slipping away. And there wasn't one thing we could do about it. We couldn't hold on to them for another moment. Oh, to have a friend in the valley of the shadow of death. You see, dear friends, the only one who can walk with you through the valleys, the Lord Jesus Christ. When death comes, when you have to leave all your friends behind, when your fingers slip out of the grip of your family and your loved ones, and you step into eternity, the only one who can take your hand is Jesus. He's the only one who can lead you through. My Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Death comes to the saint and the sinner just the same. If you're saved tonight, you're not immune to death. You know that. 
We're all going down that road. We're all getting further up the line. And soon we'll be top of the line and, and it'll be our turn. The difference is, the difference is, my dear friend, that when the child of God dies, it's absent from the body, present with the Lord. When the, when the child of God dies, when they have to go through that valley, the Lord is there immediately at their side. For He has always been. While for you, my dear unsaved man or woman, and you're walking through that valley of death with nothing but your sin wrapped around your soul, dragging you down into the depths of hell. Oh, we don't like to talk about hell. Folk don't want to hear about hell. You read the Belfast Telegraph, you go to the obituaries, everybody goes to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. Everybody's looking down on us. All right. It's not like that. It's not like that. There are souls that go to heaven, and there are souls that go to hell. There are souls that are saved, and there are souls that are lost. And for the child of God that has to go through the valley of the shadow of death, yes, this side of eternity, there are those who will grieve for them. There will be those that will shed a tear for them, but not, not as those who have no hope, because they know where that loved one is. And they know that they're with the Lord, which is far, far better. When death comes for you, dear friend, who will hold on to you? Who will hold on to you? Well, when death comes for you, what will it mean for your soul? When death comes for you, where will your eyes open? And what will you behold? We read of the rich man in Luke 16. It says he opened his eyes in hell. Opened his eyes in hell, being in torment. Crying. Would you send Lazarus to drip, dip his finger in a drop of water? Cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flea. Folks, that's where you're going if you're not saved. That's where you're going. There is no hope in death for you. There is no peace in death for you. There is no companion in death for you. There is no help. But look at this psalm this evening. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Are you wanting to know the secret of a peaceful life? It's Jesus. Do you want to know the secret of a triumphant death? Jesus. But finally tonight, I want you to see that this psalm unfolds for us the secret of a glad eternity. For the psalmist says, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> oh, beloved child of God, when we're in the house of the Lord forever. Can you imagine it? Redeemed of God. Can you imagine that day when we get to glory? That moment when we open our eyes, whether we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death or where we meet him in the air and we don't have to taste death. What will it be to see Jesus? My, the scripture tells us we'll have perfect knowledge. That'll be great for me, for I'm as thick as two short planks. But that'll be great for me. That'll be a new experience. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 12 says, Now we know in part, but then shall we know even as we are known. It'll be glorious to understand all the mysteries of the universe, to understand all the mysteries of eternity, to understand all the glory and majesty of Almighty God. What will it be? Perfect knowledge. But we'll have perfect vision. You see these boys here? Oh, I'll just be laying them behind me. Don't be putting these in the coffin, because I don't need them. I don't need them. 
the Lord was to rapture us now, these old boys would fall to the ground. You don't need them. When you get the glory of perfect vision, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Everything that has hindered, everything that has hampered us as the people of God will be gone. The old sinful nature will be gone. The flesh will be redeemed. And we shall see Him face to face. Not only shall we see Him, but we shall be with Him and we shall be like Him. And what we could only imagine in our mind will stretch out before our eyes and we'll walk the street of gold. We'll breathe the very atmosphere of heaven and we'll hear the singing of the choirs. Oh, it'll be wonderful. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. But you know, when I get to home, when I get to glory, it'll be the place of perfect Perfect rest. Perfect rest. Psalmist says in Psalm 17 and verse 15, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I, I, I was going to say I have to laugh at women sometimes, but that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. But... but but the ladies are a wonderful breed. They are, that doesn't sound right either. But you know, when you're going to look at a house, and you're going to buy a house, and, and she goes into this house with you, and you've looked at 20 or 30 beforehand, and she says, she says, oh, darling, it's perfect. It's perfect. I want it. Perfect. It's perfect. Look at the wall. Look at the windows. Look at the floors. It's perfect. You're no one at two minutes till she's ever ripped it. <laughs> and she hates the doors and she hates the fireplace and she hates the bathroom and she hates the cabinets and she hates the kitchen. And you're no one at two minutes till she's, she's... See, when we get to heaven, brothers and sisters there'll not be a thing we'll want to change. Not be a thing. We will be overwhelmed by the beauty. We will be wonderfully contented with heaven. It'll not be a disappointment for us to be with the Lord for all eternity, to behold the beauty of the Lord, not only before us, not only around us, but the beauty of the Lord within us. Paul talks about the glory that's going to be revealed in us. The glory that's already there through this great work of salvation, but is, is hindered and hampered by this old flesh and the sinful nature that so easily besets us. But when we get to heaven, that's all gone. And the glory and the wonder and the beauty and the power and the might and the absolute majesty of our soul's salvation will be ablaze, unhindered and unhampered for all eternity. Isn't that grand? Oh, I tell you, there's such glory going to be revealed in the child of God. But what about you, friend? What about you, my sinner friend, tonight? What will eternity hold for you? You see, in, in a lost Christless hell, there's not even a drop of water. Not even a drop of water. And there's nothing you will be able to do to change your situation. You'll be lost. Not just for 10 years or 20 years or 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years or a million years, but you're going to be in hell for all eternity. For as long as I'm in heaven, you'll be in hell. Now, I want to ask you a very blunt question tonight. And I want you to answer it honestly tonight. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Even if you're sitting here tonight or watching in from home and you're saying, I don't believe God and I don't believe in heaven and hell, let's set that aside. Let's just answer that, this question. 
if what we're saying tonight is true, and the Word of God is true, and everything that lies out in eternity is what we have said it will be tonight, is this what you want? To be lost for all eternity. The Bible says, what we reap, or what we sow, we reap. And if you live a life without the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll reap the harvest of a lost eternity. But here's the wonderful thing. On that green hill far away, outside the city wall, the dear Lord was crucified to die to save you all. And on Calvary's cross, the Lord Jesus Christ had died to save your soul tonight. Died to bring to your life His peace and His blessed assurance and His heaven. Would you not come? On the cross, He took your sin in His body on the tree to make a way of salvation for you tonight. Doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter where you're from. doesn't matter what you've done. He can save you. The wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is this. You can come to him just the way you are. But he'll not leave you the way you are. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away and all things become new. I wonder tonight, is there one soul in Bambridge Baptist Church, who would say, I want Jesus. I want that salvation tonight. I want that peace. I want that assurance. I want that heaven. Who would be full enough to leave here tonight not saved? Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts and to our souls. We're going to sing our closing hymn, I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Come to me, I'll be thy stay, find in me thine all in all. Will you come tonight? Will you trust Christ as your Savior? Don't miss this opportunity. You might never get another. Be safe tonight, dear friends. Let's stand together as we sing. <clears throat>
Father, we just pray tonight that there may be one who might call upon the name of the Lord and be saved this evening. Father, we just feel so burdened for the souls in the meeting not saved. We long that they would be saved. Father, how could they turn away? Father, we just pray tonight that when the voice of man is silent, that thou would speak on. That God, the Holy Spirit, would convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And Father, we would hear the news of a soul being saved. Father, we thank thee for the fellowship here. We pray thy blessing upon it. We pray, our Father, as our fellowship continues round a cup of tea, that, Father, that fellowship will be sweet as we give you thanks for everything that has been prepared for us. But, Father, tonight, Father, save a precious soul, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.